uh, I'm, I'm testing. Can can everyone hear me? Yes. So, everyone, everyone hear me? Yep. Okay. That's a yes. Okay. We have to keep the lights on so I can read my manuscript. So I think you can still see the images on the screen. But since we have a small crowd, speak up, correct me if anything is, is wrong. And also, you are not a captive audience. If you want to leave, leave, you won't hurt my feelings. Now, I am Merrill McCord, and that's the cover of a book I wrote. There we go. And this is my grandson, Peyton, who's going to operate the slides. Yay. Tech guy today. Okay. Nell O'Day. Nell, o Nell O'Day had so many different talents and entertained and worked with so many different generations in so many different places, including abroad for so many decades that many generations knew her for only one or two of her many talents. And because of her continually evolving talents and continual changes in locations to live and venues to work, the histories of entertainment couldn't keep up with her. And that included the records of the golden age of the dance, as well as the arts of motion pictures, Broadway, prologues, vaudeville, summer stock, radio, television, and on and on. So we hope to put her life in perspective and prompt a broad recognition of all of her talents and greater appreciation for all of her contributions to the wide, wide world of entertainment. Nell herself will actually help us do that because she left behind her personal collections of family and professional photographs along with letters and papers in which she described her life, her careers, and the times in which she lived. And her last closest friend, a gentleman named Robert McKay has shared all of this material with us. In fact, many of the photographs that you will see today came from Nell's personal collection. Nell made her first debut thousand of miles away from the limelight that would engross much of her life. She was born Mildred Nell Roach in September 1909 in a small community near Dallas, Texas. At four, she wanted to be a dancer and, at, and an actress. And at five, she was put upon her first horse to ride. When Nell was eight, her family moved to Los Angeles. By the time she was nine, as shown in this photograph, Nell was dancing and entertaining her playmates and shows on the front porch of her home in Pasadena. By the time she was 10, she was taking ballet instructions under such legendary teachers as Martha Graham and Ernest Belcher. By the time Nell, who is seen here at left, was 16 or 17, she was dancing at the Hollywood Bowl and doing ballet bits in motion pictures. In one of her many letters written during the 1970s and 1980s, she recalled dancing in films featuring major stars like John Barrymore, DeLois Costello, and Colleen Moore. Nell also was appearing as a ballet dancer in prologues. Prologue is P-R-O-L-O-G-U-E-S. Prologues were live stage shows performed in major movie theaters before or between the screenings of the motion pictures. 
throughout this very busy period of her young life, Nell managed to keep up with her academic studies and to graduate from high school with high honors. Nell received her first big break in the world of entertainment in early 1927 when she was picked to be a member of a young ballet course that did a prominent act in a major prologue that was staged during the run of a major film at a major theater. As the program handout shows here, the theater was the Grauman's Egyptian on Hollywood Boulevard, and that theater is still in operation today. The Grauman's Egyptian Theater on Hollywood Boulevard, and the movie was Old Ironsides, and the prologue was titled 100 Years Ago. The Los Angeles Times reported that Nell's course stopped the show. After working in that prologue for seven days and nights a week for 15 weeks and having studied dancing for years, Nell decided that she had enough training and experience to turn pro. And so she did at the age of 17. Nell's, Nell's first professional job was with Fanshawn and Marco Incorporated, a huge production company that employed almost 3,000 performers and technicians, provided prologues weekly to numerous movie theaters on the West Coast, and competed with the Zachville Follies produce, to produce some of the most elaborate shows in the history of the American theater. As indicated here by one of the thousand of publicity photos in the Marco collection at the Huntington Library, that's the Huntington Library in San Marino, California, the Marco prologues were well known for their spectacular and unusual stage shows and their long course lines of girls called the Sun-Kissed Beauties, who were forerunners of the Rockettes. Choreographer Busby Berkeley, who worked briefly at Marcos, later will admit that the Marco sets were his inspiration for the wild sets he created for his Warner Brothers film musicals of the 1930s. Nell was a sun-kissed girl at Marcos for a while and then was teamed with a male dancer for a duo. Despite the promotion, Nell kept on the move. She left Marcos, performed in prologues at the Warner Brothers New Movie Theater on Hollywood Boulevard, and that theater also is still in operation today. So she did a prologue at the Warner Brothers Theater on Hollywood Boulevard, and then she joined a popular fellow act of six young song and dance men for an engagement in Chicago at the, as the headliners in prologue for a circuit of deluxe theaters. She not only would dance, but also would sing and even do some acrobatic acts. Shown here is a publicity photo of the new team. During this move from L.A. to Chicago, Nell Roach assumed the surname of Nell O'Day for billing purposes. This variety ad in November and December 1928 shows her first use of that name, Nello Day, and it shows her first national publicity. Nello Day soon became the star of not just of her act with the six boys, but also of all of the Chicago prologues in which she performed. She again worked seven days and nights a week 
and between performances rehearsed the next upcoming show. Meanwhile, at the Paramount Theater at Times Square, John Murray Anderson, Murray, M-U-R-R-A-Y, John Murray Anderson, who was a famed Broadway producer, director, playwright, lyricist, actor, dancer, set designer, and even a lighting technician, was putting together a Broadway-like prologue to play in Paramount's big movie theaters throughout half the country. Anderson learned about the talents and the popularity of Nell and the guys and brought them to the city for his show. During this move, Nell became a platinum blonde like Jean Hollow. Okay. Okay. With her new look, she posed for this publicity picture with her gang on the set of Anderson's prologue in New York City. Please note that Nell has on a dress that touches the floor. Although such long dresses made her dangerous acrobatic moves more dangerous. This is what she always wore during her acrobatics. It was so hazardous that the Brooklyn Eagle newspaper reported at the time that Nell was the only dancer on the American stage to do her type of work in long skirts. While Nell also sang and danced in the numbers for the six boys, it usually were her acrobatic performances that brought on lavish praise and admiration from reviewers and screams and loud applause from audiences. The Paramount prologue opened in New Haven in early 1929 and remained on the road for almost seven months, going from city to city from the northeast to the southwest as far as Texas where Nell celebrated her 20th birthday in her native state. Nell again became the star of the show and received outstanding reviews everywhere she went. Throughout the tour, local businesses and groups tried to entice or hire the popular Nell to promote their products and causes. For example, in this photo, she is trying to get the attention of the press to a new airplane flight tutor machine that was being demonstrated by the inno innovator at an air show at the University of Pittsburgh Stadium. When the Paramount prologue ended in October 1929, Nell and her team again were signed by John Anderson, this time to be in a movie that he had been engaged by Universal Pictures to direct. Originally, the production was to be a biographical musical starring big band leader Paul Whiteman, but later was changed to be a review, review, R-E-V-U-E, -E, review, like the Zagfield Follies, consisted of a series of unrelated entertainment acts. The movie was named King of Jazz after Paul Whiteman's professional nickname. And the climax of the film was the playing of Rhapsody in Blue, which Whiteman and his orchestra had premiered in 1924. In the, pro, in the photo here, Nell and her guys are performing one of their acrobatic acts in late 1929 on the Universal lot for studio publicity photographers. And there's another one of those long, dangerous dresses. This one even has pleats. 
The team did three song and dance and acrobatic numbers in the movie, and Nell received glowing close-ups during these three routines. Unfortunately, however, as Nell revealed in a 1977 letter, film footage of 72 bars of music were cut out of her big production number before the film was released. Though King of Jazz also was the film debut of radio singing star Bing Crosby, theater ads for the picture's premiere in April 1930 included this photo of Nell while leaving Crosby out of the picture. And the ad called Nell a new personality girl whom you'll love. Years later, photos of Nell and Crosby would get together on the same page of a booklet that came with the DVD of the restored movie. King of Jazz was a critical but not a financial success. According to researchers and authors James Layton and David Pierce, who did a detailed, complete book on the movie, the production lost well over a million dollars, a lot of money in the early 1930s. It seemed that the public wanted a musical with a story and not a series of unrelated acts. After Nell and the, after Nell and the boys completed their commitments for the picture in January 1930, they returned to New York to work six months for the low circuit of movie and vaudeville theaters. In July 1930, Nell and her team went into rehearsals for a Broadway-bound musical comedy titled Fine and Dandy, and starring veteran entertainer Joe Cook, whom New York Times critic Brooks Atkinson called the greatest comedian of the time along with Ed Wynn. The play became a big hit and kept Nell and her associates busy for 15 months. The cast had about 100 performers, including a highly praised 17-year-old dancer named Eleanor Powell, who would become a major star in MGM musicals. While Nell had no legitimate theater acting experience, the producers cast her as the ingenue. They could not have regretted that decision, for as usual, Nell received outstanding reviews, not only from Broadway critics, but also at every stop when the company hit the road. Though Nell was the ingenue, the book for the play provided her character with logical scenes for her also to perform unusual, her usual acts with the boys. The book was by Donald Ogden Stewart, S-T-E-W-A-R-T, -E who 10 years later would win an Academy Award for his screenplay for the Philadelphia Story. Fine and Dandy premiered in Boston on Labor Day, 1930. Of all of the performers, including star Joe, Look, Joe Cook, the Boston Globe critic singled out Nell for the most compliments, acclaiming her singing and dancing and calling her charming. The day after Nell's 21st birthday, the play opened in New York City at the Erlanger Theater, which now is the St. James Theater and gave 255 performances during the next eight months. At the time, Nell lived in or Nell Greenwich Village, and according to her close friend, she often walked the 40 blocks to her apartment alone after her nightly performances. 
following the summer break, Fine and Daniel played at 13 locations in the East during the remainder of 1931. Except for Joe Cook, reviewers gave Mel more praise than any other cast member, and newspapers and magazines published more photograph photographs of her than of any other players. Of Nell's 1930 publicity photos for the play, this is the one that appeared in the printed media most of the time during the Broadway run and road show. With New York City newspapers running pictures of her periodically, with critics raving about her beauty and talents, and with full houses of audiences seeing that for themselves, Nell became a popular girl about town, especially among the stage door Johnnies, including novelist John O'Hara. Nell also became the darling of New York portrait and sketching artists. And here are two examples of draw here are two examples of drawings of her. Nineteen thirty two brought Nell back to reality. It was not a good year for her, and it also was a heartbreaking year for professional stage performers of all kinds all over the country. The year actually opened with Nell and her gang hilarious, for they had been invited to appear in a review in London and were free to go. However, their happy, high expectations were short-lived because at the time, the British actors' equity and the U.S. equity were not getting along. England not only were denying requests by American performers, including Nell and the Morris, to work there, but also was ordering American performers already there out of the country. Looking back at that incident in one of her letters, Nell would write that being denied the opportunity to perform in England at that time and seeing the country before World War II was the greatest regret of her career. Disappointments continued. The Great Depression and the growing popularity of radio and sound motion pictures were keeping people away from stage shows. Vaudeville houses were closing or switching to films. And movie theaters running prologues of vaudeville acts were replacing those with inexpensive but popular amateur talent contest. Only seven shows were surviving on Broadway, and even officials at the famous Temple of Music, Carnegie Hall, were considering converting that place to a movie house. Headlines in variety told the story at the time. The heads <coughs> The heads at the top showed that England indeed was blocking and kicking out American performers and that vaudeville shows were hard to find and at a new low around New York City. The third headline describes Broadway as, quote, just a roadway show. It just ain't the old street anymore, unquote. And last but not least, Burlesque was out on a limb. With platform for the feet disappearing before their eyes, Nels and the boys had no choice but to go separate ways and search for new careers. Fortunately for Nell, fortunately for Nell, so she thought, 
She was signed by the New York City talent scout for the Fox Film Corporation to a contract in mid-1932 to make movies in Hollywood. At the time, the Fox Film Corporation, which had been founded in 1915 by an immigrant with the adopted name of William Fox, was still three years away from merging with 20th Century Pictures to form 20th Century Fox. Unfortunately for Nell, she would be just one more victim of the Hollywood studio system of the 1930s and 1940s. Back in those days, the major studios signed countless pretty young girls and handsome young men to so-called term contract, term, T-E-R-M, to term contracts and much fanfare and many promises. However, those supposedly long-term contracts had six-month options and most of those countless would-be stars would be released quietly after six months and limited chances to show their talents. On signing Nell, the Fox Film Corporation ballyhooed nationally that the next film starring its superstar, Will Rogers, would be a musical and that Nell O'Day would be his leading lady. However, that musical was never made. For publicity purposes, another practice of the studio back then was to shoot photographs of the newcomers, males and females, with established Hollywood stars if possible. And those pretty young girls also had to be short in glamorous bathing beauty and even sexy photos poses, most of which had nothing to do with the characters that the actresses would play in the films. Here, here is newcomer Nell O'Day talking with some unkempt person on the Fox lot. A close look revealed that it's actually Spencer Tracy, Spencer Tracy, who, who was a Fox star at the time and was returning to the studio from the polo field. And here is Nell in one of the numerous risque shots in the studio made of her for various uses. Some of her Fox film photos will remain in circulation and appear in commercial ads long after she had left the studio. Now fully dressed, Nell is shown here on a Fox Film Studio set between takes of a production with one of her directors and leading men. During her disappointing six-month stay at Fox Film, Nell played the seldom seen ingenue in a comedy feature that lost money, and she was the leading lady in a B, in a B Western, B stands for budget, in a B Western. While back in Los Angeles, Nell found some pleasure resuming a teenage habit when she lived there, riding horses in Griffith Park. After being released by the Fox Film Corporation by early 1933, Nell decided to stay in Hollywood and work as a freelancer. With that decision made, she bought her first automobile a brand new Studebaker sedan for which she paid $780. During 1933, Nell played the leading lady in four short films, one of which is pictured here, starring comedian Harry Langdon, a superstar of the 1920s who was trying to make a comeback. Though now almost 24, Nell then played a high school co-ed in a mild exploitation feature. She ended the year at MGM in a drama feature, 
but viewers blinking their eyes more than once or twice might have missed her a little scene. Having gone from being the toast of Broadway to a film bit in Hollywood, it was time for Nell to return to the East, where she was respected and treated like a star. During this move, she became just a plain dark brown. By early 1934, Nell was back in her element, the stage, and is seen in this fading 90-year-old snapshot. She was back walking on Fifth Avenue. That is Nell at right. Broadway had recuperated, but prologues and vaudeville had not, except for vaudevillian superstars such as K. Smith, Bob Hope, and the Marx Brothers. However, there were some new kids on the block. There had been grand openings of summer stock theaters throughout the Northeast, and Nell would become a star and even a coach at those places. Major regional stage theaters were being used for so-called tryouts, that is, premiering plays to test their potential for Broadway. And Nell was in those too. During this 1934 through 1939 period of Nell's life in New York City, she demonstrated more of her different talents and worked in more different venues than in any other period of her career. After a futile attempt to help review, to help revive vaudeville, Nell performed in two successful plays on Broadway, several shows on the road and in regional theaters, and countless summer stock productions in Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and New Jersey. One of her summer stock roles was the ingenue in the, in the Pulitzer Prize winning Our Town, Our, O-U-R, Our Town, opposite its playwright, Thornton Wilder. When not on stage, Nell was back in front of movie cameras, appearing in two motion picture features and three short subjects. And here too was a new kid on the block, at least for Nell, something called industrial films. They were predecessors of today's infomercials and likewise were financed mainly by commercial companies to promote their products and services. In one of her letters, Nell estimated that she made about 15 industrial films some of which were to be shown at the 1939 New York World's Fair. Also during this busy period of her life, Nell made her debut on radio and was invited to perform at benefits and to dance at a New York City High Society ball. And she began spreading her wings, becoming a Broadway first-nighter a Renaissance activist and a student of the histories of cultures and the arts. However, she found time to ride her beloved horses in Central Park and to get married. Her husband, Ted Fetter, Fetter, F-E-T-T-E-R, her husband, Ted Fetter, was a popular Broadway lyricist, a cousin of Cole Porter, and a member of the elite Broadway circles. Nell was accepted by those circles during her marriage, but she would end the marriage within a few years because her husband wanted her to stop working and criticized her talents. Nell's first Broadway show this time around was a drama with an unusual plot about religion. It was directed by Lee Schossberg. In her next Broadway production, a social review of sketches, songs, and dances, 
and directed by our old friend John Anderson, Nell played nine different characters and as seen here, did a special dance with Gene Kelly. Nell's movies included a recurring role in a feature starring Fay Ray that was shot at the old refurbished Biograph Studio in the Bronx, and she played the leading lady in two reelers made at Warner Brothers Vitaphone Studio in Brooklyn. One of, her leading, one of her leading men in the short film was Bob Hope. Following the closing of Nell's Broadway hit in 1939, Hollywood came calling. Deja vu? Or did this really happen before? It did, and it didn't turn out well. Could it happen again? Nell had to wonder. Surely not. So, she signed a term contract with six-month options, of course, with Warner Brothers, and once again headed for Hollywood with high hopes. Hollywood, however, just provided her a set for a repeat performance. Amid the usual fanfare, Warner Brothers announced that Nell would have a principal role in a feature starring Laurence Olivier. That was another film never made. Once again, Nell had to pose for eye-catching photos such as the one seen here. But studio publicity photographers and just as Fox Film had done, Warner Brothers cast her in supporting roles in only two features, released her at option time, and continued to use her photographs after she left. This time, Nell rebounded quickly by taking advantage of another one of her many talents, horsemanship, or should I say horsewomanship. At Universal Pictures in June 1940, Nell won auditions of just a dozen other actresses to work in the studio's next two series of B Westerns starring Johnny Mac Brown, who had been the real life hero of the 1926 Rose Bowl football game and who had gone on to become a romantic film star at MGM. With Nell wearing pants, boots, and gun holster at her side, physically fighting and shooting the bad guys, and riding as fast and as hard as the hero and the other men in the pictures, she, she created a unique character in the history of women in Western films. Medium running inserts show that it really was Nell riding like the blazes and not a stunt woman. Her breakneck riding scenes were the highlight of the series with the brown, especially with the little boys in the audiences. Besides riding for the universal cameras, Nell at the time also competed in horse shows in Southern California. Of the B, of the, of the 10 B Western series of the 1930s and 1940s that featured three heroes, Nell was the only member of such a team. The third member of that trio was played by comic singer Fuzzy Knight, shown here at right. Nell, in effect, was the series co-star as the hero's partner in fighting crime. Their characters never had a romantic interest in each other, despite the fact that the universal publicity photos indicated otherwise. Before we leave Nell's home on the range, let's take a last look at some fancy footwork by the former 
ballerina. In, addi in addition to her Western with Brown, Mel also worked in non-Western features with Universal's other stars, such as W.C. Fields and Deanna Durbin. In the studio remake of the classic drama Backstreet, she played the daughter of superstar Charles Boyer, with whom she is shown here between takes of the picture. With the future of the economy and the motion picture industry unclear because of the threats of war, Universal did not renew the contracts of many of its players near the end of 1941, including W.C. Fields, Edmund Lowe, Hugh Herbert, Helen Paris, and Nell. However, Nell had had her Universal term contract renewed twice and had worked at the studio for 18 months, an unusual length of time for Western film girls. Nell remained in Los Angeles for four more years, during which time she experienced the full spectrum of emotions. On the high end, she married again, this time to a Hollywood supporting actor, Larry Williams. On the tragic side, her mother was fatally injured on a Christmas Eve when she was hit by a car while crossing a Los Angeles intersection. Although Nell's film jobs were limited during the early 1940s, she kept busy with volunteer work for the USO and charities dedicated to the war effort. And with writing screenplays and magazine short stories with her husband. Back once again in New York City in 1946, along with her husband, this is Nell, at the age of 36. She worked in a few more industrial films, appeared on radio programs, and was involved in some of the episodes of the historic television show, Hourglass, Hour, H-O-U-R, Hourglass, which ran from May 1946 to March 1947. At that time, New York City had three pioneering TV stations all with limited broadcasting ranges. Nell and her husband continued writing magazine short stories, some of which were adopted for television. They became well known in literary circles by hosting gatherings of writers and would-be writers at their Greenwich Village apartment. One of their frequent guests was a young J.D. Salinger, the future author of the celebrated novel the Catcher in the Rye, in the Rye, R-I-E. The couple continued most of 1951 researching and writing a biographical play about a historic British patron, his wife, and their unusual Victorian marriage. Nell and her husband then spent much of 1952 in England overseeing production of that play which opened at, the, at London's Royal Court Theatre. The opening really was the grand reopening of the theatre following its restoration from damages caused by bombing during the war. With some rewriting, the play became a hit. Back to New York once again, Nell landed a leading role in the Western House Studio One TV show her husband's short stories continued to be adapted for television, and jointly, they wrote a play for a television program. During the mid-1950s, they lived off and on in Rome and Sicily, together at times, separately at times. After their final separation, Nell alternated living and working in Italy and New York City until she decided in the early 1960s to move back to her hometown, Los Angeles, to live the remainder of her life. There, she started a successful writing and editing services 
and was rediscovered by fans, researchers, and the media. We got to wrap up. During her apparently last uh, public appearance, shown here, Nell was honored at the annual 1984 at the 1984 Cinecon Film Festival in San Francisco. She died in early 1989 following a long illness. Though Nell wanted no services of any kind, a longtime neighbor and friend, in effect, gave her a memorial with the following words in a letter to another one of Nell's close friends. Nell's courage, grace, and generous spirit touched everyone who knew her. All right, now that ends the presentation, and you're welcome to leave, but if, you, if any of you, do any of you have questions at all, raise your hands. Okay, now, uh, a commercial, one minute commercial. As I say, I wrote a book on Nell, did five years of research. I will have a table at some point in selling books that I've written. I've written books before related to the movies. But you don't have to buy a book. If you see me, come on over and ask me a question about anything that's old. But don't ask me anything in this century. But anything in the last century about all kinds of movies, music, World War II, anything, uh, ask me because I was around and I enjoyed talking to you. So just come by and just say hello and talk and maybe we have a good time. Again, I'll, I'll be around here a few minutes if any of you have questions. And thank you so much for coming because Nello Day, as you know, is so unknown today, I, I would not, I didn't know why the anyone would show up. So thank you so much. You've been a very attentive audience. Thank you.